Welcome to Big Blend Radio's Virtual Cafe. Pull up a seat and let's find out who we're having a happy hour conversation with today. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Big Blend Radio's Happy Hour Show. We love this monthly show every third Friday. We're here hanging out. And today we're having a literary hangout because it is National Book Month. And so we have writers, authors. Um, we've got a little bit of everything. Book lovers. Um, lovers of the written word. It's a craft. And um, a little bit later after our podcast chat uh, with everyone, you're going to hear from author Clifford Garstang, who wants to be here, but he just literally got, <laughs> I was going to say literally, got inundated with book events. So we're going to hear from him. But um, first, let me get all our guests on the show, so give you a little overview of who they are, what they write, what they do. So, um, and we're going to find out what they're eating and drinking. So I think we're going to get into the Big Blend Radio book bus. And as you all know, we have Priscilla the Pink Sock Monkeys, our travel guide, as Nancy and I travel the country. She is our, our Love Your Parks tour mascot, but she can also drive a bus and fix cocktails and food. And, and I mean, she's just an amazing little sock monkey. So we're going to drive the book bus. And um, right now we're outside Charlotte, North Carolina. So I think we're going to go up to Maine, where the temperatures seem to be the same, and we're going to go hang out with Matt Cost. He is an amazing author of multiple books, and he is also known as the king of happy hour here. I don't think he's missed one, maybe one. I don't know. But the king is here, so um, we're on our way to you, Matt. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. It's good to have you back. And everyone should know your website, mattcost.net. Um, what can Priscilla fix you for your happy hour drink and snacks? Um, I guess right now I'm going with an Italian soda with a little bourbon in it. And, Ooh. Um, cheese and crackers is always good with me. Now, Italian soda, is that going to be like, I don't know what, like, I don't like know. Like a what... San Pellegrino raspberry thing. Oh, oh, that's pretty good. And that feels fallsy like you know yeah it, it's not a normal thing for me to combine those two things but it seemed mm. like fun so i did it yeah well you know give everyone an overview of your books because did i you have been super busy this year like the last few months i'm going can we even get matt on the happy hour show like you know <laughs> um i've written some historical fiction standalones but then i also have three series the fifth book in my Clay Wolf Trap series came out in April. It was Pirate Trap. And then the second book in my Brooklyn 8 Ballot series came out in July. Uh, that was City Gone Askew. And four weeks from today, the sixth book in my Mainly Mystery series, Mainly Mayhem, will come out. Wow. And did I see that you have a new series starting? Um, yes, in April, I have a new series uh, starring Max Creed, which is a modern day uh, Robin Hood adventure series where Max Creed and his band of uh, fellows attempt to bring justice against the ultra rich for the poor that have been abused by them. Wow. All right. I'm digging this. I'm digging this. Well, are you ready to go south? <laughs> I mean, they get, could go south on this show anytime, but on Big Blend Radio on any show. But are you ready to go to Florida for a little warmth? I don't know about you and going into warm places. Are you Are you cool with that? We'll keep the um, air conditioning on. I'm not sure that I would go to Florida right now for a little warmth. That seems to be a place <laughs> to avoid. But uh... I know. I know. It's been rough. Florida, we were just there. Um, and we were just around the corner from Katie. And uh, Katie Walls is our next guest, Kathleen Walls. I'll go to katiewalls.com. That's K-A-T-Y. She's a travel writer and author, photographer. And um, we were right around the corner, literally, from her. And then Milton said, I'm coming. And we're like, no, not with us here. We're out. We're going to Savannah. <laughs> um, and then we found out as we got to Savannah that Savannah wasn't doing that great either from, you know, the, the Hurricane Helene. So, um, but anyway, it was, we, we were safe and freaking out about Katie. But Katie's here and she's been through a number of hurricanes and She's a strong gal. So welcome back, Katie. How are you? I'm doing well, considering all the hurricanes two in a row. Uh, I've been yeah. working a lot on updating an older book, one of my ghost story books, The Host with Ghosts, which sort of focuses on a lodging, either a hotel or a bed and breakfast. 
and then tell us other things to do in that area in the southeast. And it's gotten kind of outdated, so I'm updating it a little bit. And, of course, my music book, I've been doing a little promotion on that one. Not as much as I should, mm. but it's hard to what? do promotion. Well, it's that's that other side of, you know, the, yeah. you want to craft and, you know, we all want to create, but then there's that marketing side and, you know. The marketing but, is the worst part. That I don't enjoy the marketing. <laughs> I get the research and that's one sort of playing around with my real the mystery series that I kind of want to do. And I'm thinking, no, I don't have time and, you know, what's the point? But it's kind of playing around in my head. So it'll be another mm. one. That will be my fourth in the real the mystery series. In that well, one, I what, have my my heroine. She's uh, a property manager, which is what I used to be at one time in St. Augustine. And um, somehow or another, every time she rents a place or gets involved with a tenant, something goes wrong and she's trying to evict them. And it makes her look really bad when they get murdered with her and the gun in the same room and things like that. Doesn't go over good. So she runs off places where they came from trying to extradite herself from all of her problems so it's a little bit of travel and a little bit of mystery and just mm-hmm. a lot of fun it's it's kind of a light-hearted ones I, I like this i like that i you know and it it's it's good that a, a woman is in there in a strong role you know right. people are tired of being shown as you know we're running through the woods on high hills and falling right. over tree trunks and roots. <laughs> well and, she does her share but and then there's a few little paranormal things where they go sell her out when she's running through the woods but she's mm. she's a pretty tough little gal mm. i like the paranormal stuff i've been getting into alien stuff lately <laughs> it's kind of trip no it is it's like it's like um I got stuck in, I don't know if it's a cult yet. Matt, I'm checking this out for our cult <laughs> show coming up in November. Um, but, um, I'm starting to wonder, like, where is the bridge between, like, the ghost stuff, the alien stuff, and the cult stuff? Like, how connected are they all or not? I don't know, but that's a whole other thing. I'm doing my research, but I'm fascinated about the grays that walk the planet Earth. They're, they're like, the they're idea recycled that we were- aliens. That maybe we'd be the only planet that life evolved on. It's kind of ridiculous when there's millions out there. Logically, some form of intelligent life evolved in many of them. The well, one that amazes me is a story, and I don't. They made a movie out of it about this couple that was supposedly abducted, and it seems very. They weren't trying to promote themselves. They were. They didn't know it. Realize what had happened. They had a memory loss, and I don't remember the names, but they were driving, and all of a sudden. There's a missing piece of time, and it was a mixed race couple also, which was another reason they didn't want to get too public. And um, when the psychiatrist was examining, you know, he was having problems sleeping, he starts telling this story about being abducted. And the psychiatrist says, wait a minute, he gets a wife and then hypnotizes her, and she tells the same story, but neither one of them remembered it. You know, other than mm-hmm. the hypnosis, I don't remember the name, but it was very, very prominent back in probably the early '60s, and they did make a movie out of it. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm into all this stuff. This yeah. is cool. So, Katie, um, we're going to go on a road trip. Okay, we're going to keep things warm. We're going to go across to the desert. I hope you're ready. We're going to go to Tucson. I'm ready. But um, what, what would you like to eat and drink, little sock monkey who might be an alien too? You never know. <laughs> um, <laughs> you never know with that little Priscilla. Um, what what would you like? What would I like? Mm-hmm. Eating and drinking eat and wise? Drink. Yeah. Well, I just yeah. had I had made some wine from my um, muscadine grapes because they were just I had tons of them and I didn't want them to go to waste, so I hadn't made wine in years and I experimented with it. And if you like sweet wine, it came out pretty good. Oh, so I've been well, making yeah, wine could, coolers with that. Yeah, wine cooler that would be good. And what would you like to eat? Oh, crackers and cheese right now. Oh, well, you and Matt are sitting in the same booth. <laughs> Got to okay. have that with wine. Well, this is the thing about the book bus. A book bus is important going in through communities. And, you know, what I'm really, you know, all this devastation with the hurricanes and Helene and, and these very remote areas that, um, you know, little libraries in suburbia is great. Yeah. But a lot of the libraries and stuff. So I want to talk about libraries on the show because I feel like we have to do something about libraries and yeah. all the little libraries go going back and um, 
we have to do something, but we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out as recovery yeah. goes. Of, of I'm what thinking as done, people but... get their internet back, I would be willing to donate to victims the, some of my books on, you know, as an ebook that they could read it. Yeah, and at least have something to do. You know, yeah, while no, I, the I house agree. is getting rebuilt. I agree. I think it's important. I really do. So, all right, off we go. We're going to get back in the book bus, and um, and the book bus does look like it comes out at the '60s because we feel like. It, why not? You know, so I'm going to get Eva Eldridge. Uh, you know, she's been on our show for years. She's also a travel writer. She's an editor. She works in the book industry. She loves books, reading. She listens to a lot of books and knows everything about books. And then she'll say, no, I don't know everything, but I know she really does. We have great conversations about this all the time. I don't think an hour goes by when we see her that we don't talk about books and the industry. Right, Eva? <laughs> Welcome back. Great. Pretty close. Yep, that's true. <laughs> yeah, I think since the day we met you at a gathering, we've just talked about books and writing and reading and press releases and it's never stopped. And um, you've done so much, you know, you've gone to graduate school. Tell tell everybody about what you do now. I know you still travel, right? But um, just a little glimpse of what you do. Well, right now I'm, um, I just pop, I, I'm, Publishing other people's books, um, I republished um, Karen Liptak's book, uh, which is called The Messenger and the Skeptic. It's a tiny little poetry book that is full of illustrations that her daughter did. It's kind of, I think it's kind of cool. And so that's available now on Amazon. And we did, me and a, and a friend did all, redid all the images and the poetry and set it up and uploaded it to Amazon, which even though I had a lot of the background in my graduate program, I never uploaded anything to Amazon before. So that was fun. And now I'm working on a second book for her formatting, doing the formatting for it. And um, that should get uploaded in the next, or at least it'll be formatted and ready to go in the next three weeks. She just went on vacation. So I don't know what her goals are for that. Um, oh, I'm also wow. doing working on mech marketing and trying a little bit which i agree it's not fun but has to be done and learning how to use canva and and some other tools to help you know help authors become more um uh, out there you have to do social media whether you like it or not which is i think part of the reason some of us are on this podcast because you got to do it and then mm-hmm. I have Sisters in Crime, which I'm uh, the acting president. And right now I'm working on membership. And the other thing is a little bit on getting um, a program as program director. So I'm doing several things with that. And, and I just, are you guys I just, working got, on... back, oh, and I just got back from Maine. I was in Maine, in oh. New England for the last two weeks. I got back yesterday. So that was fun. You so you were in Matt's land. Yeah. yeah well, I went to, um, we went to, um, to the Northwoods, Westmanland and Bangor and, um, down through, uh, um, a few other places that I can't remember. We did a lot of driving. We hung out and, and visited a lot. It was just beautiful. I really like the state. So I'm quite impressed. And we spent, time in boston and um in the boston area mm. so you you did the the tea thing i'm fascinated isn't it december 6th when we overthrew like the tea that was like the tea party i'm not the political party that i'm talking about but that we yeah. threw the tea over and said no you're not going to tax us but i mean it was right. just such a brilliant takeover right i mean what happened what so. went down is insane and I didn't, you know, I didn't understand what the tea was like until um, years ago. We worked with a tea shop out of Idlewild, California, when we lived out by Joshua Tree. And they had the actual bricks of tree, of tea. And he came on a podcast this when we were first starting. And um, they had the bricks. He goes, Lisa, this is what tea actually looks like. <laughs> this is it. You know, this oh. is the original thing. It wasn't like you're throwing tea bags or tea leaves in the ocean. They were bricks. Like, they, like, and they were bigger than bricks. They were bales of it. And they threw something like 43, 46 tons of tea into the harbor, 
which is really impressive because um, the ships aren't that big. And um, they worked in concert, you know, dressed up as as Native Americans and trying to hide mm-hmm. themselves and the secrecy they kept. They did a whole play. They did a bunch of stuff in the reenactment. A lot of it was just to entertain, right? But it was some of the facts behind that is stuff I never knew. So that was just That's amazing. Cool. I love the reenactments because it keeps history alive. And for kids to understand that, Matt, you're, you're a high school teacher. Isn't that kind of thing helpful to get the story across? Because often textbooks, here's like, you know, the Boston tea thing happened on December 6th and, and they threw tea out and said, no, we don't want the British, right? That's not good enough. There has to have this other story for I don't know. There's like something that has to happen. I mean, that's why you write, right? As part of that is to get that story across. Oh, for absolutely. For people to understand history. I used, I used to uh, teach junior high social studies, and I did teach about the Tea Party and uh, a lot of the revolution to my students. And uh, for the Tea Party, we would actually reenact the scene, and we'd have different groups doing it. So that was always fun and a, a rambunctious time in the classroom. Wow, this is fun. This is fun. I like this. So everyone keep up with Eva at EvaEldridge.com. But before we go on to our next Tucson guest uh, from the Tucson Sisters in Crime, which is an awesome organization. And Matt in Maine is part of the sisters, even though he's a man, right? <laughs> you can be male and um, oh, I shouldn't say who's what gender, but everyone's welcome to Sisters in Crime across the country. It's really Eva, you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Because it is open because we've had gentlemen on the show as well throughout the years with you. The National Writing Organization to support, it started out supporting women writers because they weren't getting recognized with awards and stuff as much as the men. But we don't care. Um, Anybody Mm -hmm. who's interested in writing and supporting the organization is welcome. We like to support new writers. Um, We like to help support existing writers to make sure that they're getting what they need to produce what they want to produce. So Matt in Maine, if he had a character come from Tucson, Arizona, he could join the Tucson group? Anybody can. we We have members across the country and it's, it's just finding the group that you work, that you can relate to. Mm. Okay. No, I'm I'm a member of New England Crime uh, Sisters in Crime as well as a national organization. So there there are definitely misters in in crime as well. There's Absolutely. a mister next to the sister. There you go. <laughs> That's how we can put it. Eva, what would you like Priscilla to fix you to eat and drink? Um, another cup of tea right now mm-hmm. and some good chicken noodle soup. That sounds good. Eva needs that. All right, it's that change of seasons happening. All right, so we're going to go and meet C.B. Wilson, and C.B. Uh, is a relatively new member to the Tucson Sisters in Crime, I believe, and she writes about dogs. She's got dog, dog friendly. We like that since Nancy and I pets it across the country. Go to her website, C.B. Wilson dot, uh, excuse me, C.B., the, the initials, WilsonAuthor.com. So welcome, C.B. How are you? I am doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Give us a little overview of what you write and your dogs, because we got horses coming soon. <laughs> well, I write cozy mysteries. Uh, basically, it's about a cat person's journey of canine discovery. So it's a cat person who is in the do- lives in the dog friendliest city in America, and it's her adventures with different breeds of dogs, trying to uh, get along with them and, and solve a mystery with them. My books are fun. They're a romp, and I promise if you don't laugh, I didn't do my job. Oh, well, I'm welcome to the show. You're perfect for happy hour. So I like this, a cat person. So this is like Taylor Swift got a dog or met a dog somewhere, and the dog changed her life? I'm Pretty just much. Just politically could be fun. <laughs> we probably well, shouldn't go there, but, like, it would be fun. <laughs> I'm just well, saying. The, the, the next one is uh, book 10 comes out in January, and it's called Puppy to Death. And I had a ball writing about puppies. I mean, it's a totally different ball game than it is dealing with uh, full regular dogs. So it was just so much fun. Oh, puppies are cool, though. I mean, and so do you <laughs> have to learn about the different breeds? And then, like, did, do dogs ever murder some, somebody? Does that ever oh, no. occur? <laughs> no, no, I had to ask. Just the dogs... <laughs> The dogs yeah, are helpful. <laughs> animals are always innocent in my book. Like you can't, 
you know, don't blame the dog, you know. Um, so, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, even in this recent hurricane, Helene, a little boy um, was rescued because his dog, he was, uh, his, the, he was at his grandma's house and the mudslide happened, took her house and everyone was in it and, and neighbor came to try and find him. House is demolished, right? And they can find the daughter, they can find the grandma, grandpa, but they cannot find the 11 year old boy. And the dog's barking. They're like, yeah, the dog's just upset. Well, the dog sat where the boy was buried under this rubble of the house. And that's how they could save the, the young boy who's in a hospital here now. But isn't that amazing? Wow, dogs are. So you can never, ever point fingers at an animal, ever. No. You know, it's but I, really, it, I love your story because I do a monthly newsletter. And in it, I have a section that's called, wow, a dog did that. And I love bringing all of those stories out because there's so many of them all over the world. And it's just, mm. it, it's so wonderful to see what the uh, what the dogs can do. I think you've got cat and dog people on the show today, from what I know. I think, yep. Matt, you've got dogs. Eva's got dogs. Katie, you got cats, right? So yeah, you're well, the, I used you're... to have a dog for 17 years. I had, well, I had Manny, but he was my baby. Okay, so cat and dog. And Eva, yeah, cat too. Um, we'll find out as we move on because we got horse people, more cat people, dog people. Uh, we, I want to go, uh, CB, what would you like to eat and drink? Please don't tell me I have to give you a dog bowl of water. <laughs> <laughs> I, at this point, I think we're going to go with what Cat, my heroine, loves, and that's a Shiraz du jour and um, definitely some nachos. Oh, yeah. We're in Tucson. Well done. Well done. Ooh, yeah. Ooh. Oh, my gosh. I, what I would do for a really good plate of nachos right now? Yeah. Oh, yes. Mm. Yes. <laughs> and a margarita. Oh, my gosh. Okay, that's what I want right now. So, Priscilla, let's get going. We're going to go to L.A., Los Angeles area for Cheryl Luchin. Uh, Cheryl is the author of Love Earth Now. She's writing another book, too. She's an environmentalist. And you can go to her website, CherylLutgen.com, and that is L-E-U-T-J-E-N. Um, and everyone's links are in the episode notes, so check that out there. So welcome back, Cheryl. How are you? Thank you. Doing well. It's nice and cool here today, too. Oh, that is awesome. So I wanted to ask, um, what would you like to eat and drink? I still have some work to do today, so I'm going to stick with sparkling water, but, um, and those nachos sound really good. Mm-hmm. So this well, crunching will one. keep you awake, too. Yeah, I'm exactly. just saying. <laughs> it, it will. It will. Now, Cheryl, um, tell everybody, because you've, you've written this book, right? But you still have been writing over time, right? And, and then you've got another book you're working on. So it seems like pen and paper has kind of always been your friend. Well, not always. I, this is um, about career number four, depending on how you look at it. I was a geologist and environmental law attorney and I had a store. So, yeah, I thought this is a career number four. But um, writing has always been a part of what I do and how I how I get through my my day. <laughs> within <the> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I think it is. It, it's, you know, it, all those careers, you still have to do reports and you know, how do you do like a geological study? And even in, as a lawyer, isn't lawyers from what I've learned as lawyers, that is how you, you have to write things as a lawyer all the time, yeah. right? Right. I was uh environmental compliance attorney. So I not litigation, not lawsuit kind of writing, but still writing information for clients to understand how to stay in compliance with environmental law. It's not scintillating stuff, but it's important. And and but also at the end of the day, journaling is really important to me too. So that's that's mm. the steady part. So when you journal, are you writing it purely for yourself so you can skip out stuff? You know what I mean, and just almost mm. do a shorthand, or do you write it that maybe one day your kids find it, or um, uh, that it's something no, this, later? This is therapy. This is just for me. <laughs> so you can do your own Cheryl shorthand, right? Exactly. <laughs> now, when you when you wrote Love Earth Now, did you do you type that out or you know what I mean because journaling is a little different it's more sure personal, yeah right so it's yeah. a diff- different thing yeah I, I I write book writing on my laptop um I just I, I need to go faster than my my fingers can go faster on typing than writing if I if I'm writing at longhand something that's going to be read by someone else my brain tends to get in the way and think oh you shouldn't say that mm. before I could just you know 
least at the early stage, you just need to get it out and keep going. <laughs> mm. So now, are you a dog or cat person at all, or horse? Who knows? We, we have we cat. Animals. Yeah. Uh-huh. My cat brought me a little mouse this morning. So yeah. Ah, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> that's thought. so cool. Well, that's a gift to you, you know, when they bring you one cat that we pets at Joker. So Nancy, my mom, you know, hangs out downstairs. I'm working upstairs and she gets to do the daily. Like, it's like we want food. And this cat has her little squeezies and and basically had Nancy wrapped around her finger or toe, whatever you want to call claw. And one day comes running because she gets out of all the lizards and the skinks. She jumps on the table where Nancy is jumps up and tries to throw a lizard into Nancy's mouth. That was like, <laughs> that was time. I love you. Here's your special delivery of lizard in your mouth. And I just heard Nancy like, yeah, I can't even, it wasn't even like a scream because I don't think you wanted your mouth open. Like she just did this sound downstairs and I'm like, what in the world? And she's like, she tried to feed me a lizard in my mouth. And then the lizard went down her chest. And it was, the mess. It was a mess. So oh, I've not, not had that uh, pleasure. <laughs> no, it it was it. Yeah, but that little that little cat did a lot of yeah hummingbirds, everything, little brat. But um, that's nature. But we're gonna go up to Central California to chat with one of our dear friends, uh, Christy Wood. She has the ABCs of Horses podcast with us here on Big Blend Radio every second Saturday, where she teaches horse lovers how to take care of their horses talk about riding we talk about you know taking care of your tack uh, horse care is the main thing and you can keep up with you've got to go right to wdnhorse.com wooden horse wdnhorse.com and everything is there and she's a world champion horse trainer everything and an author so welcome back christy how are you thank you lisa i'm fine thank you for the invitation of joining everyone yay and now you're a dog person do you have cats too I have a barn cat, so the barn cat ah. is to keep the mice out of the barn. But I have uh, I, I share my home with uh, two Scottish Terriers. Scotties are cool. They're, I love my you Scotties. Know, you know what? The, we just pets had in Florida one little dog scout, and I'm looking at him going, "You got Scotty in you. You got Terrier. There's a whole different Terriers are different. They've got a from Jack Russells to you know Scottish Terriers. They have this." Um, like, I don't want to say the word stubborn, but they're kind of like, I'm going to do this. They're kind of independent in a way, right? Well, you say like- I, have, I have one that's just so devoted to me and he's actually very calm and uh, he travels with me quite a bit. And um, it just depends on their personality. They can mm. have some terrier traits, but the personalities can be different between the breeds and the individuals. So tell everybody about your books, because these all revolve around horses from horse care showmanship and then also getting into we also help people in crime since we've got crime writers here i think <laughs> and <laughs> i don't think it, my books are going to go into the crime into crime except except there has been a few injustices in the third book that i wrote about but my first book is actually a a manual to help people be successful in putting on a, a horse event uh, primarily horse shows so uh, as a horse show judge i'm an international horse show judge i travel around the world and the United States judging, uh, having the opportunity to judge some fabulous horses. But uh, I've uh, judged some really fabulous shows. And I've also had to judge the horse show from hell once. <laughs> and that was that was having standing in the arena for 23 hours because the show was so poorly managed. So I came home and wrote a handbook of how to prevent that and help people be more successful. So that book's doing quite well. It's called Your Best Horse Show, A Guide for Managers and Exhibitors. And then my second book is uh, about one of uh, our lesson horses that lived to be 32 years young. And it's his life story. So actually, the horse was named uh, Ranger. The book is titled Ranger, the Little Horse with the Big Heart. And Ranger is the author. So it's 100% in his voice describing his life with humans and other animals. Uh, and it's just a tremendous book. So when CB said, "If I may, I have to make you laugh with my books, I think my books probably invoke um, tears which is kind of sad to hear, but there's uh, I write with a lot of emotion and um, really extra- explaining how a horse thinks, and um, it's very rewarding. But Ranger's book uh, starts in the womb and it ends in heaven, so it really takes you his through his entire life. 
And then my third mm-hmm. book's called Hoof Prints Across Time, A Trail Ride to Remember. And it's my memoirs of riding the 1,300-mile Nez Perce Historic Trail uh, through four different states. And it's um, it takes 13 years to complete this ride. We ride 100 miles every year. And my memoirs will talk about the history of the Nez Perce, the Appaloosa Horse, the beautiful land that this trail goes through. And um, you'll meet the people and... Uh, mm. we're, keep, we're keeping history alive with this book. I think that's what's important. Uh, the trail rides been going on since 1965, so I'm on my uh, fifth rotation of it. I comp- completed the fourth rotation, and I'm doing it again on a, on a half brother to the horse that I rode the first time. And it's just, a, it's just, I'm really involved with history of the Native Americans, and it's something that I want uh, people to come and enjoy. And to read about, if you can't put your foot in the saddle, at least uh, I'll make you saddle sore. So there's where the tears probably come in. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, no. And, there, and, you know, there were some injustices we did back in 1877 with the Native Americans. But um, the the trail truly speaks to you if you come along and enjoy it. Um, it's amazing mm. how the history comes alive. It, it, I think, you know, we've done so many shows with you on it and it just every time I'm like, I have to like sit back for a few minutes and just kind of absorb everything because it's so deep because you're walking, you know, riding in the foot, footsteps, really, you know, yes. and um, seeing the real things. And then Nancy and I being up there earlier this year in, in Joseph, Oregon, I'm like, Christy, we said yes to Oregon, Joseph, but we thought it was over here. But now we're going in the northeast corner in like ice storms. Like, what the heck? And you're like, well, you know, you got to think about what Chief Joseph and them went through. And I'm like, this sucks. <laughs> it's cold. But then we saw bald eagles when we drove in. I mean, we're going through literal hell and there were bald eagles everywhere. And we're like, yeah. all right, it's pretty. There was an avalanche warning, but who cares? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's been quite a year. But um, Christy, Priscilla, who you've met and actually put on a horse. Priscilla has sat on my front perch, yes. Yes, yes. Um, What would you like to eat and drink? Well, if my day is done, I'm going to have to make sure there's a time frame here. Uh, I'm going to enjoy a cherry Coke with a splash of Jack. (laughs) Ooh, I'm in (laughs) shock. But let me tell you, I only have one, and it takes me hours to finish it. I'm a sipper. (laughs) <laughs> so I don't, I don't drink it very much. I, I do not know Christy drinking, but um, I know why now. I know. <laughs> but this is cool. So now what would you like to eat with that? I would love to have some beef sliders that are on Hawaiian sweet bread. Ooh, that's good. That's good. Now, Christy, <clears throat> as a kid, did you read horse books? Like My Friend Flicka, Black Beauty, things like that? Yes, I did. Mm. Any favorites? Any favorite like book for you as a child? Uh, there was one called Silver Wings, and it was in a, a small little paperback, and um, it was very. It was a, it was a, a, a fictional book, but it was very wonderful with the uh, horse being a part of this young man's life, and um, it was inspiring. See, okay, we got horses going on. We got dogs. We got cats. We've got history, we've got tea, we've got all kinds of stuff going on here. So let's go up to Cheryl in LA. We're doing the, we're, we're turning the bus, we're all going around, but we're all on the bus, right? But Cheryl, um, I wanted to ask you, what kind of got you to write? I mean, I, I understand all these different careers, right? Which are all connected yeah. in some way. But did, did you read people's journals or those kind of books, memoirs as a kid? Or what inspired you to write? Do you have a favorite book as a child? As when you were a child, I was going to say, I'm not calling you a child, but don't we all want to be children again? <laughs> right. <laughs> I want to be a child again. Yeah. Sometimes. I don't know. <laughs> These days, being a child is, doesn't sound as easy as it was when I was a child. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I actually prefer my era of childhood because Me we too. got to play outside and do stuff. Yeah. yeah. Build exactly. forts and stuff and jump off houses. Like literally, but anyway, yeah. Did you have any special books that inspired well, you? Maybe it's just because of this conversation, but I'm thinking of my friend Flicka and Black Beauty. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, I don't know what it was. My you know, Black Beauty was such a big thing, and Anna Sewell is, is such an animal rights activist, right? But my friend Flicka really got me personally. That book, I don't know why that was a different thing. Maybe because of the full. I don't know. 
But um, as a kid, I, I would read anything. I would read cereal boxes. You know, I, I just loved reading and reading was my escape from things I didn't know how to handle. <laughs> do you have, what do you think about libraries nowadays? Oh, I'm going into the library discussion because I feel like our, we need to support libraries. I just Absolutely. feel that and I'm not 100% understanding of what's going on because every place is different. But, um, what do you, what do you think in that now with everything being so digital of the necessity of libraries? I think they're essential. In fact, I, I, I dedicate a section in the new book I'm writing about libraries because there's so much more now than books. You know, you can, a lot of libraries, you can borrow tools or you can borrow their 3D printers or you can borrow their music editing state, sound stages. And it, there's just, uh, they're really adapting to the evolving world in a lot of ways that I think is very exciting. I, I learned how, I mean, I remember when we lived up in the mountains in San Diego in like 2000, 2001 or something, being able to, in our little town, tiny little mountain town, kind of like Three Rivers where Christy is in, in central California, being able to go get CDs. Cause I mean, this was like, we had dial up back then. Right. And I found out all kinds of music that I didn't know and fell in love with. And it was like, this is so cool, you know? You know, and, and it was hard also bookstores staying current in a place like that. We also had a video store, which I think is pretty cool. You got it. I mean, I kind of miss video that the whole, like, put that big chunk in the thing, you know, I kind of miss yeah. that. But yeah, so that's cool. Christy, what about Three Rivers? What's it like for libraries and bookstores for you in your area of Tulare County? Well, we have uh, a library. Uh, right behind the school, the uh, elementary school here in Three Rivers, which is very, very nice. It's for the whole community, and they hold several events there as well. Uh, but uh, the, the next biggest town for me is Visalia, and there is a Barnes & Noble there. As a matter of fact, I, they hosted me for a book signing in May, which was exciting. Uh, there's a smaller little bookstore, I think, in the town of Exeter. and But um, mm. primarily the bigger stores are the ones in the larger towns where – the people that live in the rural areas like I do need to go to, to really find all the books we want. That's hard, huh? I think libraries are so important and having events, you know, it is. I want to go over to CB uh, Wilson again, a CB uh, for you. What What is, when you think about books, you know, growing up, what inspired you with dogs? I mean, I, you know, I've, I thought, God, you know, I start thinking of some animal things were big. I mean, I think that's what actually got kids to read were animals. Oh, no books. question about it, Lisa. <laughs> but I, I have to say, uh, what I well, what I read as a child was I loved Nancy Drew books. Oh, yeah, and yeah. Here's, and here's the problem. I kept rewriting the endings because I didn't like the way Carolyn Keene ended the books. Huh. That's funny. So, so that's how so you started like, saying, like, yeah, that's cool, That's kind of how that started. But honestly, when I started writing about dogs... It was because of my mother talking, go, tr- going back to the terrier, she ended up, my mother's a couch potato. She doesn't really even like to get out of the chair to get water. Um, and she ended up getting a Jack Russell terrier, which was probably the worst choice possible for her for a dog. So the inspiration for Christy the series was that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was really trying to help educate people on the different breeds of dogs and the different traits of those dogs. Because, look, if she had gotten herself a Cavalier King Charles, all of us would have had a really happy 14 years. Wow. Well, Jack, yeah, we had a Jack Russell that killed our, like, we, when we were lived in Kenya, we had 13 dogs. Oh. With German Shepherds, Northern Mixes, and you needed them. We had one called, one brother and sister called Mork and Mindy. They were all, like, they were mutts. Um, but then we had a lot of German shepherds because she had puppies and you kept them all. And that's your protection where we were. That was our guard where all these dogs and people walked to the other side of the street when they went by our house. Um, and then we had a Jack Russell, Katie, and she was the worst out of all of them. Like if she, if anyone, want, if you wanted to be scared of the dogs, I mean, German shepherds can cause some havoc, but Katie she killed our this we had this uh pintailed wider bird this beautiful long tail and we had this tree stump in the ha- like in the yard and we would always watch for 
the pintail to come down because it's just this beautiful long tail. I mean, it was just, I mean, we were so lucky living in Kenya. There were taracos and all these just exotic birds in your backyard and garden, right? And Katie just always wanted to get at her. And one day she did. And Nancy was like so mad. And we're like, what are you going to do? But um, yeah. And then she went after one dog and that didn't do. Yeah, that wasn't good. That didn't end up very well. But but Jack Russells are like, excuse my language, everyone, but badasses. They are. They are. (laughs) Don't like chihuahuas and Jack Russells ever had a fight. That would not be good. No, <laughs> no, absolutely not. But, you know, there was a, a comment that I did want to make on the libraries uh, as mm. I was listening to everybody speak about them is I belong to the Friends of the uh, Library organization. And boy, these are a, a bunch of people that support libraries in any way that we can for fundraising. And it's it's quite an organization. I mean, for all of us, I think especially readers, it's really important that we do continue to support the libraries in their many different endeavors. Um, I'm up in north in uh, the Phoenix area in Glendale, and we have um, our library has a podcasting room where you can actually do your own professional podcast out of a library uh, room that all you do is sign up for. It's it's really exciting to me the different uh, avenues that wow. the libraries are taking in the area. I had no idea, you know, because we travel full time. But you know, whenever Nancy and I would move somewhere new, the first thing we did was get a library card. In fact, you needed to get the electricity and everything turned on so you could get the library card. The library card was mm-hmm. the first thing to do. And there's also so many historic ones. It's That is fantastic. Oh, yeah. Eva, Eva, I want to go over to you. Um, let's talk about what inspires you because I know you read uh, or like, audiobooks, everything, a little bit of everything. I mean, you're pretty eclectic, but I know you like sci-fi and everything. But as a kid, was this something for you? Um. I read about horses. I was no. a horse, <laughs> yeah, it horsey is. girl. Horses. Amazing. I love this. I oh, read wow. everything I could get my hands on in the library, which wasn't much, actually. It was a small town in Colorado, and then I moved on to Zane Gray books because you could get those paperbacks oh, yeah. almost everywhere. But that's – I read – I didn't read Nancy Drew as a kid, which is weird. I'm not sure if that was in my library or not. I just read everything with a horse in it. I read Nancy Drew, but I preferred the Thomas, the Hardy Boys. The, who's Thomas Hardy now? But the Hardy Boys was my thing. But, but yeah. yeah, that is interesting about you with the horses. So what do you think about libraries? The importance I love of libraries. That? I'm a member of Pima, uh, Pima Public Library. Um, I support them and the librarians. And here's the thing. When we're driving through New England, all these little towns, they all have these really cool-looking libraries. Not that I stopped and went in them, but you drive by, and almost every little town we drove through had a library, and they're in these amazing buildings, and I'm just thrilled that there are libraries everywhere. Mm-hmm. Well, it's the funding gets cut a lot, so we have to watch it. That's why I bring it up. You know, we're in that year, that um, election year, so sometimes I always want to bring that up, not to be political, but to look at our candidates funding things like libraries and that education, because that is, you know, it, it's um, it, a way it for avails, people that can't get it. Yeah. Like Pima, Pima account. I mean, it allows them computer access so people can apply for jobs or look up information. It has, you know, books for children. It has children's programs. It has audiobook programs where, you know, you, everything's downloadable now, practically. Um, and and it it supports it supports so many things that are that's important to our our public right mm-hmm. they're they're amazing things they're venues for artists too and there's so many historic libraries there's one in new york city i want to go to i have to look it up again but like you know and, and i think libraries and bookshops have to that's something you know as travelers we should go to them too you know support those bookshops i mean bookshops are uh, i've spent uh, bookshops with like coffee in them or champagne, like bring it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Kathleen, what about you? What did you read as a kid? I, one of my favorites was Anna Green Gable series. Ah. And then I read an awful lot of Greek mythology. I was never much for fairy tales or anything, but the Greek mythology, I guess, sort of took the place of fairy tales for me as a kid. Hmm. 
and and the libraries. Of, I yeah. love libraries. But the sad thing is, at one time I would buy a house, fix it, sell it, move it. Did a lot of moving in my life. And one of the things when I would move, the first thing I would look to make sure the new house I was looking at was close to a library. And lately, I found I, I mean, I am close to a library here, but it has, it's not the major factor that it used to be. And that's kind of sad because I like libraries and and independent bookstores, especially. I independent love bookstores. To see yeah. the independent bookstores because they have such a hard road to hoe with fighting, competing with Amazon, and we're all on Amazon. We, you know, we really don't have much choice. But a lot, I know the ones with the Southern Independent Bookstores. Uh, if your book is published through Amazon, not that you're on it, but if you publish with Amazon, they won't stock your book. Most mm-hmm. of the, well, the books. Yeah, yeah it's kind of weird. Them. Yeah, there's a weird. Um, this big corporate, you know, yeah. stuff is hurting the people that create the content, right? And right. so eventually, because what do they we give expect? such a huge discount. I mean, we're giving a fifty-five percent discount to the distributor. Who it used to be forty percent they would pass so on. Now they're passing on forty-six. I've been told, but they still take the fifty-five from us. And you know, when Amazon and those kind of places, they can afford to make just a couple of dollars profit on a book. And I mean, most of us as authors, you know, we're lucky if we make a couple of dollars when we sell a book. Right. And then, also, you know, um, if you've got a million people buying from you, you know, a couple of dollars is a couple of million. If you got a few people every week buying from you or every month, it's just a few dollars. Well, bookshop.org, I think, is pretty cool. That's kind of a. They're, they're trying to be the, the alternative to Amazon, yeah. which I don't know how well it's doing. Um, I've dabbled in that just to put some of the authors on shows on there. And, um, I don't know. It's, it's, um, I think it's out of the UK. And I think if an author is on Ingram Spark that they can get onto that, I don't know. Yeah. But, it's um, well, would, but they, yeah. they, they don't have the leverage that Amazon has. Well, I think this is the, so the, important the to talk about. Brick and no, you know, brick and mortar stores are the ones. That I feel so strongly for because they're, you know, they've got rent to pay. They've got some time employees and, you know, they're struggling and they're, they're kind of a tradition, kind of like the mm-hmm. libraries. Yeah. I think, um, it's, it's, it's such a huge thing to talk about. And I'm glad we're talking about it in this on the show. So thank you all for doing this because I want readers to understand what authors go through and how many years sometimes it takes to write a book, unless you're Matt who just keeps writing them, but he's, and he's good at it. He's, he can do mm-hmm. them. You can turn them up fast, but <laughs> the thing is it's a, it's a writing is like a, it's blood, sweat and tears to write. Even just writing an article, right. Can be like, yeah. God, I just need to get these thousand words done perfectly. And it's like, <laughs> ah. but a, an author doing a whole book, I'm like, Holy cow. And, and then, some books seem to just flow. It just happens. It's there in your head and it comes out. You don't have a choice. Other books, you've got to work hard on them. My, my War on the West series ended up it's going to be just one simple book from a travel trip, uh, for a press trip. And it ended up actually being three, three counting my ebook with it. But it took me about four years to do it. The research, because yeah, I wanted everything to be historically accurate in it. Well, that's the thing. And it's the same as writing music, right? For musicians and songwriters, Mm -hmm. sometimes a song just channels right through you. And it's like this magical song. And then sometimes you're crafting a song for years, 20 years. I've I've interviewed so many musicians on this and write music. And it's like, and it's so hard because you have to get it into like a song versus like, uh, anyway, I want to go to Matt, Matt. I know you know about bookstores, right? And Amazon and all this stuff. What is your feeling? And, and we'll get into your childhood book in a second. But on that note, with this whole thing about what authors go through, you know, you work with different people on your books and your different series. How hard is it for an author, actually, when we look at it all? Um, no, I mean, it, it's a lot of work. Uh, to address what Eva was talking about, I have visited many of the libraries in New England, especially Maine, and they are just wonderful places. I've done 39 speaking engagements in the last five months at New England libraries, and they're the center of the town. They're the hub of the whole place, and they're always just positive and upbeat. So 
uh, all the power to libraries to keep going. And, you know, we can add bookstores onto that for sure and say, you know, the, the independent bookstore, we have a nice little independent chain here in Maine called Sherman's, which I really enjoy, that has nine stores and they're just really author friendly. But do we make a lot of money? I think I make about a dollar sixty seven per book sale. So <laughs> it's it's a lot of yeah. work. It's a lot of but by the way, everyone Powell's out of Oregon, I'm just saying, like that's a dangerous place to go. Um <laughs> it is. It is, because every time you go, you there's like Nancy and I have filled up a shopping cart, a literal shopping cart in a bookstore in Powell's. <laughs> And then we went, what the heck are we doing? You know, um, yeah, they have a room for music, a room for history, like multiple rooms for history. It's like this, it's a, it's magic land when you go in there. And I, yeah, I mean, this is so important, but Matt, as a child, did you read? Uh, yeah, now I, every, everything people have been talking about, you know, obviously Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew. You know, there were there were many different Carolyn Keynes, who was not a real person, but an alias that many different authors wrote, wrote the Nancy Drew books under that were fabulous. Um, but, you know, I, I got to thinking about horse books, as everybody else did. And Misty of Chintotig <laughs> was always a favorite oh. of mine. There you go. Yeah. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. Christy, have you read that? Oh, that was a good one. I, I think I did if that was a long time ago but that was a very good book and of course disney made a movie about it so i definitely saw the movie hmm. yeah, i believe there were four in the series and i just loved those as a kid so is it because the horse is like been through so much historically they've carried people through war they help you know build farms they help they're just there's so much human connection with the horse the same as dogs that makes horse books dog books cat books i mean cb do you join in on this i mean there's something about this of the animal connection because they're not they're not the animals are not um judging you as as you know animals well unless you're an idiot to the animal then then you should be judged and banished if you're rude to an animal but um i think there's something about that connection between what let me go to Christy real f- first. Christy, with a horse and a human, isn't that a big deal because they're going through war or something epic together? This relationship, and that's what it is. Or you're going through a show jumping thing, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Let me tell that you, this is there's a, there's a spiritual connection with any animal. We can say your dog, your cat, and, and especially with the horse. Um, you do so much more. I mean, your dog can walk down the street with you, which is great, or ride in the car with you. But when you get on the back of that horse, that horse takes you places, a lot of unknown places. There's a lot of trust that needs to be instilled here in riding in the wilderness, which is what I do. But there is a spiritual connection, and not every human being is going to, to look at that horse and realize that there is a spiritual connection unless you take the time to understanding. CB, what, what do you say from your side about that connection? Oh, I think that the dog is just so supportive. Um, there's, it's unconditional love. And there's, in, in the human psyche, that is just a wonderful thing. And mm. someone who does a non-judgmental and is, stands by you no matter what, it's, it's a win, no matter how you look at it for everybody. What were you saying, Matt? Oh, I was just going to mention that I do have four dogs and, Therefore, I'm hiding in an upstairs room so that they wouldn't bother me. But still, the UPS truck came, so I did have to mute it because, you know, it was pretty much chaos downstairs. Oh, <laughs> you're talking about you. Yeah, <laughs> there it is. There it is. Um, so I want to I want to go back to everything on, you know, in regards to libraries and all that. But we need to talk about who we want to spend happy hour with. When we think about happy hour, we're going to close up soon here. But who we want to spend time with when we are all avid book lovers, you know, um, whether we're reading or writing them, we want to go through who is your favorite author that you want to spend a happy hour with. And you get to bring a fictional character. So the author and the fictional character can be there and they can be separate books, you know, all of that. 
could be one of your fictional characters that you've written about. Um, so who are you going to go and hang out with and where are you going to go? Because that's interesting. And of course, the menu for the guest. So let's start with you, Matt. Um, who are you inviting for happy hour? That's an author and a character. Um, you know, lately I've been reading Lee Goldberg books, which I think are just fantastic. Uh, a wide variety of things. He has a Sharp and Walker series about firefighting and a historical yeah. present day one called Calico. So, you know, I'd probably uh, invite him and then maybe I'd invite James Lee Burke's Detective Robochaw character to join us. And the three of us could hang out and maybe drink a little bit of bourbon and uh, may- maybe have those uh, nachos or maybe some uh, chicken street tacos. Ooh, ooh, nachos and street. Mm, this is sounding good. This is good. <laughs> what about you, Katie? Oh, when he said Rope Shaw, that made me think of all of the James Lee Burke books, which I dearly love. You can't give Robert any alcohol because he's a recovering alcoholic. But I guess right now I'm mostly kind of hung up on the uh, James Patterson, uh, Maxine pa- Patio books, the woman's murder mysteries. The character in there, the main character, Lindsay Box, is, she's just a really tough, good woman, and she's trying to do a job as a police officer. And, of course, it's all the murder and mayhem in it. But uh, they're fun books, and sometimes I don't like the way they end because sometimes the bad guy gets away. <laughs> Most of the time, I like the way they solve the problems. Ah, that is that is the thing. It's like the problem solving, and you get into mm-hmm. their heads, right? That's it. Yeah. That's it. What about you, Eva? Can't Eva's find gone. my unmute button. Uh, um, then, unmute yourself. You. You you stick. I for I was not prepared for this question. Mm. I'm always I'm always into whatever book I'm currently reading, or most of the mm. time I am. And right now I'm reading a a young adult fantasy called Ascendant, and it's by um, Michael R. Miller, and and it's it's about a dragon, a, a dragon. So I know that sounds silly if I if I. If I could have Anne McCaffrey in her Pern world, that would be great. But she's you passed can. away now, so. But you can, well, you can bring, I could. you can bring anybody. And yeah. I'd love to be on that world with any of their those characters because that's and that's actually science fiction, not not uh, fantasy. Mm-hmm. So that anyway, there's where I am right now. <laughs> so what are you, what are you gonna? eat and drink with them and are you going to go to a different planet or where are you going oh, what would i eat and drink mead i probably drink mead i think mead is a, uh, a mm. common goblet here. you need a goblet uh, i don't care what i drink <laughs> actually and then um I'm, I'm eating i don't know maybe um Chicken, roast chicken. But we're back to chicken, Matt. We're back to, well, I'm, I'm sick, I'm sick, so I, I like chicken. Yeah. When I'm sick, well, Matt, so. Matt started off with the cheese and crackers. More people are doing cheese and crackers. You know, he is the king of happy hour. You know, he's doing this very good. So but this is cool. I love that. So I want to go over to Cheryl. What are, who are you going to take to happy hour as an author and a character? I'm a big fan of the Louise Penny series with Chief Inspector Gamache. And so um, those books take place in Quebec, which I love. And so Gamache and I and maybe his uh, second in command, Jean-Guy, are going to go over to Olivier and Gabri's uh, bistro and have some poutine and a glass of wine. Ooh, poutine. That's it. I'm liking this. I'm liking this. What about you, Christy? Oh my gosh! You, <laughs> I'm going to throw a wrench into this whole thing. Go for it. I don't because I don't. I just don't read a lot of um, fiction. I really mm-hmm. am into reality and and real life. And I am. Um, uh, there's a wonderful new book out, or it's been out for a little while by John Barletta. John Barletta was a, the Secret Service agent that actually rode with President Reagan. And the book is titled "Riding with Reagan." It's about his life of being a Secret Service agent with President wow. Reagan. And actually having to ride beside him every single time he was on a horse, he was there to protect him and guide him. A guard. Wow. 
And it's just a wonderful book. I know John Berletta. I know him. I knew him personally. He passed away a few years ago. And um, it's just a fabulous book. It's a real deep insight into the humanity and the human of President Reagan um, on his ranch in Santa Barbara. And it's, of course, it has to do with horses. And I just thoroughly love the book that he wrote. So uh, I I could sit down with John, but I'd love to sit down with Ronald Reagan personally, myself. And um, we'd be, I'm sure we would be cooking out doors on his grill and his on his ranch in Santa Barbara and probably barbecuing ribs. <laughs> so Santa Maria style, Santa even though Maria it's Santa Barbara, and- right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I love this. So um, in closing, I know we've talked a little bit about the industry itself, but in closing, let's have some fun. We were going to get into tips. Anybody want to throw out some tips for beginners? Anyone before we get into closing with a fun story? Because we have to do the story at the end. We have to. Any tips from anyone that you get want to throw edited. out? For- Be it, get edited. Get somebody <laughs> else to edit your books. I'm so glad you said it instead of me. Get edited. Yes, edit it. <laughs> Matt, any any tips? Uh, it's sort of like get edited. It would be just <laughs> get at it. All right, all right, Cheryl. Keep with it. it ah, takes, that's good. Yeah, it's so easy to quit, and it's uh, so rewarding to keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree, Katie. I think I would tell a person just starting to, to not take the whole book. At one time, I think I'm going to write a book. Think I'm going to write this chapter. Then I'm going to write this chapter. Because when you try to plunge into the whole book, it's a little bit frightening in the beginning for a new person. Yeah. Christy? Write about your passion. Write about what mm. you know, what, what creates yeah. passion in your life. Oh, I like this. I like this. All right. So let's start a story. So you know how this goes. I'm going to have um, Matt start this off because, you know, Matt's good at this. He knows about this, this game we like to play. We have um, a word. So everyone's going to give everyone a word and then you create this next thing that happens in the story. So Matt, I'm going to give you a word and then you're going to give Katie a word. Okay. And you're going to take this word, make a sentence. Then Katie's going to take whatever word you give her and she's going to create a second sentence that creates a story. Does that clear to anyone? It's, it's mm-hmm. fun and silly. So, Matt, your word is olive. Um, Who would have thought that the mere passing of an olive would start a fight in the restaurant? Okay, wow. We will give the word horse. Horse. Katie, that's yours. Yeah. Oh, boy. (laughs) Well, you're sitting in the restaurant. And what would happen if a hawk came galloping right into the middle of it and upset everybody's plates? And I guess the word I'll give is plates. Plates? That goes to you, Eva. Oh, um, the plate, oh, the olive landed on somebody else's plate. And they um, were kind of offended because they hated olives. So, you know. Then my word would be, um, oh boy, that one's a hard one. <laughs> a dessert. Ooh, Cheryl, you get dessert. Because they hated the olives so much, they immediately ordered some creme brulee for dessert, knowing that the horse wouldn't touch it. Ooh, what word do you have for Christy? Poutine. <laughs> How do you spell that? <laughs> poutine. P-O-U-T-I-N-E. Poutine. Well, I think I think what happened here is that we all were confused by the events that just happened, and we all pushed ourselves away from the table and went for a walk out back into the beautiful olive trees. You gotta use poutine. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> it's like I can't I can't so back I'm going to follow up for you Christy so back Thank in you. the backwoods there was a guy in the shack because we were in the backwoods and there was a guy in the shack and he comes from Canada but he also knows how to distill and he was making some shine and he had some poutine on the side and people said we don't care about this restaurant we want some poutine and shine and they went there and it was illegal but they paid 50 bucks 
for a shine and a poutine, which I think is pretty high, you know, a high cost. But since it was illegal and they wanted shine, that's what they got and that's what they paid. So, Matt, your word is moonshine. Late into the night, they all drank the moonshine until the poutine had worn off and sang songs about olives, horses, plates, and desserts. The end. Word. Yeah. Are you going to give Katie? All right, we're still going. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, we will go with uh, shooting star. Oh, that's a good point. Uh, after with enough of the moonshine in them, and they began looking up in the sky, and they started seeing all of these strange shooting stars, and they were beginning to wonder if that was aliens coming to Earth. And my word will be aliens. Oh, good! You're giving that to Eva. That is perfect. <laughs> I'm Eva, for you, Lisa. The aliens, fly with them. Thank you for bringing aliens back into the conversation. After after all the poutine and um, moonshine got drank, and the horse is sitting there, standing there, the aliens came down and looked at the horse and started talking to him, saying, um, "Take me to your leader." They didn't even pay attention to the drunk, stuffed <laughs> other people. <laughs> I was going to say the drunk stuffed olive because it came out of a martini well, originally. Well, the olive, Sorry, yeah. Yeah, but that all came about because of the olives, right? Yeah. Um, so, so the horse, you know, yeah. At that point, then the, um, yeah, the aliens talking to the horse because the horse is the only one there that's sober and making any sense. Um, oh. so, so my that- word, my word would be leader. Ah, Cheryl, you get to go with the leader, not the hosen. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and the aliens focused on the horse because back in their home planet, all of the leaders are horses, and so they assumed that's how it was here on Earth. Oh my gosh, I love this game so much. Christy, you get to close it up. <laughs> this is landing on you with horses in space. So um, if the, if the horses are running that, what's the rest of the story? The rest of are the they gonna story talk? is that the horse decided to take the aliens on the path, this very special path that followed the river that took them up into a beautiful, beautiful meadow where they could see the vast stars in the skies. And they all just sat down and and visited around this beautiful meadow and shared what their experiences were and hoped that we could all become friends. Well, isn't that nice? Well, we went from an olive to peace. Who knew? With horses and aliens and a restaurant with dessert and breaking dishes. That is amazing, y'all. Thank you so much for playing. It's a silly game, but it is fun. Matt, do you approve King of Happy Hour? Was that a fun story? Like, you Absolutely. Didn't know we I, I guess it was sort of like the olive branch was being offered. Oh, see? <laughs> I know. I don't know where olive came from. It just suddenly a martini came to mind and I went, oh, olive. Not martini, olive. But I'd like that with some blue cheese. Thank you. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us. we got Clifford Garstang coming up in a little bit. Keep up with us every third Friday. We are here with Happy Hour. And next month, who knows what we're going to be talking about. But it's really cool to celebrate Book Month with all these awesome authors. Again, Matt Cost, go to mattcost.net. KatieWalls.com for Kathleen Walls. Eva Eldridge, and she's the industry side as well as a writer. Go to EvaEldridge.com. C.B. Wilson, she had to catch a plane. So keep up with her at CBWilsonAuthor.com. I wonder if she took dogs and cats on the plane. You know, they may meet snakes on the plane. I'm just saying. Um, Cheryl, keep up with her at CherylLutjen.com, L-E-U-T-J-E-N. And keep up with Christy at WDNHorse.com. Don't forget, she has a show with us every second Saturday. Thank you all so much, and happy, happy hour to you. Happy, happy Thank hour. You. Thank you. Thank you, Priscilla. It's fun as always.
Hi, this is Cliff Garstang. I'm so sorry I wasn't able to join the live literary happy hour today, but I'm now back from my literary travels and wanted to tell you a little bit about what I've been up to. So it's been a busy week so far and more to come. Last Thursday night, I met with a book club at a local library to talk about my latest novel, The Last Bird of Paradise. There were 10 or 12 people there who had all read the book, which was very exciting. They had great questions. We talked about other books too. Um, it's the kind of thing that I really love. Then last night I attended a book launch event for the debut novel of a friend of mine. It was held in an art gallery, which is a great space for uh, literature, I think. <clears throat> and there was also a puppet show connected to the book. So that was fun. Today, I drove up from where I live, about 150 miles, to George Mason University, which is in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., for the Fall for the Book Literary Festival. This is the 26th annual Fall for the Book. And today, I was moderating a panel that was books about refugees, basically, refugees and migrants. And we had three great books that I had read and thoroughly enjoyed, and uh, I was able to ask the authors questions uh, after they read passages for the audience, and that was a lot of fun. Then I drove home right after that event and came to a book club meeting, not my own book club, but a local bookstore has started something they're calling the an international book club, and the book they were discussing Tonight was a book that I read a couple of years ago when I was about to travel to Budapest, Hungary. And the name of this book is Prague, which is a little odd, but it's set in Budapest. And so we had a great discussion for about 90 minutes uh, with differing opinions about this novel. Then tomorrow, my own book club, which has been meeting for close to 20 years, uh, is discussing Daniel Mason's North Woods, a novel that came out, I think, last year uh, to much uh, praise. And <clears throat> we meet in a Thai restaurant, so it's sort of another uh, <clears throat> international night uh, for me. And then this coming Saturday, another local bookstore is sponsoring what they're calling the Queen City Word Fest, which is basically a book fair plus uh, some panel discussions. There should be 30 to 35 authors in a single big room welcoming uh, the community to come in to talk about books and hopefully to buy some books. So I know that this is the month of the book and uh, it's exciting to have all of these literary events keeping me very busy. So I hope you all had fun today, and uh, I look forward to hearing the recording later. Thanks for joining us here on Big Blend Radio's Happy Hour podcast. New episodes air every second Monday and third Friday. Visit us at BigBlendRadio.com.